Okay, open your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 17. I want to speak to you tonight on mountaintop lessons and valley living. Years ago, uh, Lester Roloff was preaching on this passage at the Southwide Baptist Fellowship in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's been about uh, 1963, 1964. And he said, uh, mountaintop experiences are all right, but he said you need to have valleys because they're easier to farm than mountaintops are. <laughs> so mountain lessons, valley living. So does your life make theology come alive? People come in contact with you, and does theology become really real? Does your life give practical vitality to truth? John 12, 35, Jesus told the people, let it, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. Jesus, the light, was standing before his disciples, and he was asking them to utilize what he was in the way that they lived. Well, my question is this. Uh, is my life light unto those walking in darkness. Our theme for the year, be a beacon, and reminding us of the constant need to shine so other people can be warned of the things that it's important to warn them about. I think there is a great spiritual danger in wanting to remain on top of a sunlit mountain and not go down into the valley below. And what we learn from high spiritual moments is not to be collected in some religious scrapbook for personal review for our own pleasure. But we're expected to make our time spent with Jesus the light so that others can hear about the light. Matthew 17, 1 and following says this, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them and his face did shine as the sun and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Ye him. They responded, of course, by falling on their faces. They realized they were in the presence of holiness. So Jesus revealed some of his light to Peter, James, and John of what they called the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter was excited by the radiance surrounding Christ and by the sudden appearance of two Old Testament prophets, Moses and Elijah. And Peter, I think, did what we would tend to do, uh, that is to remain there and enjoy the high moment on the mountain. He said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elias. For Jesus, this glorious moment when the, the Heavenly Father praised him in verse 5 was followed by his going down into the valley which led to the cross. For the disciples, this moment of glory would inspire them to accept everything that Jesus was going to experience when he came down off that mountain. Now, walking in spiritual light of Christ should be equipping us for the dark roads of every valley that we face. I believe that one of the greatest errors Christians make is that of living each day of a Christian life as if it ought to be some kind of hallmark moment. We all know what that is, right? But the painless life is a spiritual mirage. The sorrow-free life is a spiritual mirage. And the fear-free life is a spiritual mirage. I've experienced pain, sorrow, and fear while trying to do the Lord's will for my life. Jesus takes us to mountains and he reveals more of himself to us, not because he just wants us to to gravitate to the, to the light, but he wants us to be effective when we go down into the valley. The goal of our being exposed to more light 
is to identify us more closely with Jesus, who is the light. For example, in John 12, 36, Jesus says, while you have light, believe in the light that you may be the children of light. We should be identified as light followers, light people, beacons to a world that is dying without Christ. And the more spiritual light we show to this dark world, the more like Jesus, the true light, we are. So I want to give you a brief outline that will focus our thinking on being like children of light. Number one, enjoy your time with the true light. Enjoy your time with the true light. It was okay for the three disciples to enjoy that radiant expression of Christ there on the mountaintop, but it was also right to enjoy the sudden revelation of Moses and Elijah. However, Jesus did not intend it to be an entertaining moment. He told them not to talk about what they had seen happen up on the mountain. He said, tell this vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead, in verse 9. So it's likely that Jesus asked them to remain silent. Why? Because the people had tried on several occasions to make him be king and by force instead of responding by repenting of sin and accepting the prophecies about him and taking him as the king. From a practical standpoint, the three disciples had been given a glimpse of the coming kingdom, which would be a kingdom of permanent light. So Jesus expected them to conduct themselves as children of light as a result of that moment on the mountaintop. So where did he expect them to shine? The answer is down in the valley where all the problems were. Down in the valley where the opposition had taken up uh, its place. Down in the valley where disease and heartaches and burdens were plentiful. A personal encounter with Jesus Christ should give us an unrestricted focus. Matthew 17 says they saw no man save Jesus only. Everybody else was gone. Their image of Jesus Christ was now full, unrestricted. John said it this way about Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 9. He says, He was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So when Jesus brings you and me to personal mountaintops, he's not trying to entertain us. He's not trying to give us the perspective of something that's always bright and beautiful, but rather he's trying to get us to enjoy our time with him, but not to consider it an end in itself. As a matter of fact, all the time that you and I spend with Jesus Christ privately ought to affect how we relate to people publicly. So the first thing I want us to look at here in this brief outline, focusing our thinking on becoming like children of light, is number one, enjoy your time with the true light. I hope you have time with the true light. Number two, act upon what your exposure to the true light taught you. Act upon what your exposure to the true light taught you. For August the 27th, in my utmost for his highest, Oswald Chambers gives us a warning. Here's what he says. Beware of not acting upon what you see in your moments on the mount with God. End of quotation. Exposure to the light is supposed to increase our perception of the value of light and it is to help us conform to the light so that we become children of light. Chambers goes on in that very same devotional, and he gives us a word of encouragement. Here's what he says. Now, I'm quoting now. Continually bring the truth out into actuality. Work it out in every domain, or the very light you have will prove a curse to you. End of quotation. God does not save us so we can skip from mountaintop to mountaintop. <laughs> Enjoying a series of exposures to the great light of the spirituality of Christ 
but making no difference in the way we live in the valley. The person who only wants to talk about his experiences rather than put the lessons that he should have learned from them into practice is a great danger to Christianity. And you can find a lot of people who are willing to tell you about their experiences, but you need to see it in practice in their lives. That's why I began the message by saying, does your, do people see theology come alive when they come in contact with you? Do the people see truth uh, gaining vitality when they come in contact with you? Chambers gives this warning also in the same devotional, August the 27th, my utmost for his highest, he says, and I'm quoting now, the most difficult person to deal with is the one who has the smug satisfaction of an experience to which he can constantly refer back to, but who is not working it out in his practical life. End of quotation. So on the mountain, Matthew 17, Jesus showed the three disciples the light that he was not because he was trying to impress them with the experience of the moment, but so that they could act like children of light when they faced his crucifixion and his betrayal. So once again, the question for you and me is this, do our lives shine and make theology come alive when people hear things about the Lord? Does your life and mine give practical vitality to truth. If you and I have met Jesus Christ personally, and we know that we did so for salvation, then we should reflect that. I think one of the most interesting things in the life of Christ reflected in the gospel is his number of references to fruitless trees. He doesn't want us to be fruitless trees. If we have met him in a separate spiritual encounter that altered our lives, then we certainly ought to be willing to show that as well. So if you and I are going to talk about our experiences with Christ, people ought to be able to see the results of those experiences, those encounters operating in our personal lives. So if you're keeping an outline, Put down number three. We looked at number one, enjoy your time with the true light. And number two, act upon what your exposure to the true light has done for you. Number three, expose deception by your truthful outworking of your time with Jesus. Expose deception by your truthful outworking of your time with Jesus. The world is filled with deception uh, one of the names for Satan is slanderer. Another name for Satan is deceiver. And on and on we could go. But deception is constantly going on around us. You remember that the Pharisees were very deceptive. Jesus called them hypocrites. They were anti-Jesus, anti-Messiah. Now, they would have told you that they believed the prophecies of the Messiah they just couldn't believe it was the man standing in their presence. The Pharisees were what we call wearers of spiritual masks. In fact, the Greek word hypocrite actually comes out of Greek drama. A hypocrites was somebody who wore a mask for a particular part in a play, and then he would go off the stage. He'd come back on to play another part and put on a different mask. So what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees, and they had to be fully aware of it, is you keep playing parts in this religious drama by changing your mask over and over again. And their righteousness was shallow and empty. Remember on one occasion he told his disciples, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall perish. Well, you know, light not only expels darkness, but true light, true spiritual light, will expose the darkness which is posing as light. So not only does light dispel uh, the darkness that's around it, but true spiritual light will expose darkness which is posing as light. That's why the Pharisees hated Jesus. 
Jesus actually started exposing swamp creatures long before Donald Trump thought of it. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew 5, 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. One thing that happens when true light shines is that it reveals false light for what it is, just a different shade of darkness. Jesus shined. He was the true light, and he, sh he shone his light on the Pharisees, and they hated him for it. So about this Matthew 5, 20 passage, Chambers makes this statement, once again coming from August the 27th, in my utmost for his highest, he says, you must be more moral than the most moral being you know. You may know all about the doctrine of sanctification, but are you running it out in the practical issues of your life? End of quotation. Howard Hendricks, one of my favorite teachers at Dallas Theological Seminary, used to tell us, young men, our faith is personal, but it was never intended to be private. In our founding father's writings, Gene Cunningham, by the way, thanks for praying for Gene. He came through the uh, bypass surgery quite well. I just chatted with him on uh, the, uh, the messenger a while ago when I was texting him. But our founding fathers' writings, it is clear they expected faith to be freely expressed in public places. Gene and I have been studying the uh, United States Supreme Court cases beginning right after Washington appointed the first Supreme Court justice all the way up to around the early 1900s. And they made it very clear, the Supreme Court justices made it very clear that the founding fathers did not intend for the expressions of Christianity to be hidden. They expected them to be public. Matter of fact, uh, one writer, Benjamin Franklin, indicated that if we are going to make sure Christian principles are passed on from one generation to another, they must be included in the teaching in the public schools. Well, The founding fathers knew that Christian principles were the foundation of the Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution. And they never gave even the slightest impression that they were opposed to public expression. If the founding fathers were alive today, they would be chagrined at the efforts to remove crosses from public display, to remove nativity scenes from public property and not to require the Bible to actually be part of public school curriculum. They'd be absolutely chagrined. If you haven't read it yet, get Dave Barton's book, Original Intent, and study it. You'll see he's, he doesn't give his opinion. He actually quotes the founding fathers, what they actually said. The evangelism mandate that Jesus gave expects public expression of our Christian beliefs. You can't go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature behind closed doors. We can't do it. It requires public expression. Well, there's been a lot of changes recently, haven't there, over the years. I don't know if you remember one of our former deacons here, Bob Davenport. I, I really loved Bob and uh, hated to see what happened happen, but Bob loved a particular song. MBC Slade wrote a song entitled, Tell It Again. It goes like this. Into a tent where a gypsy boy lay, dying alone at the close of the day. News of salvation we carried, said he. Nobody ever has told it to me. Tell it again. Tell it again. Salvation story repeat o'er and o'er till none can say of the children of men, nobody ever has told me before. Another writer, Carrie Breck, wrote, help somebody today. 
Look all around you. Find someone in need. Help somebody today. Though it be little, a neighborly deed, help somebody today. Help somebody today, somebody along life's way. Let sorrow be ended, the friendless befriended. Oh, help somebody today. But we're talking about being a light, letting our light shine before a world that's becoming darker and darker and darker. Now we can sit around and complain about the darkness, Jerry Falwell said, or we can light a candle <laughs> and let people see the light. The closer I get to the Lord Jesus Christ, the less I'm going to think of myself and the more I'm going to think of others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Let me live for others that I might be like thee. Well, let your light so shine. The reason we have mountaintop experiences is so that we'll be better equipped to walk the dark valleys of life. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together for prayer. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your blessings in our lives. And right now we ask you to touch our hearts as we sing the invitation. We'll open the altar if anyone needs to come for any reason. May this be the moment, we pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for those mountaintop experiences. But help us not to be so enwrapped in them that we ignore their purpose, and that is to equip us to shine in the dark valleys below. Speak to our hearts now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>